I'll just tell you the opening scripture today, the Apostle Paul. That boy had a hard life. <laughs> he lists how many shipwrecks he was in, how many times he was beaten up. And uh, he had one thing that was an impediment to his ministry, some physical problem. I don't think it was a torn meniscus, but it was something. And he entreated the Lord three times. <laughs> he prayed once and uh, <laughs> got no response. Now here's the chief of the apostles the one who will tell us that he did more than all the rest, and he doesn't have to tell us because we believe him already. And here he is, he prays, <laughs> and gets nothing. We've all been there. So he gives it another try. Same result. You know, they say a third time is the charm. <laughs> well, not always in prayer. One thing I do know, God is always listening. God is always answering in some way. The third time he hears a word. Now, if you don't think God speaks to us, this isn't going to mean anything to you, but I can tell you that God does. And he was told by God after the third prayer, my grace is sufficient for you. I've been telling myself this as I've been hobbling around, <laughs> trying to get things done. My grace is sufficient for you, sufficient for everything. Grace. How would you, grace, grace is what Christianity is all about. How would, you, how would you define grace? Can someone give me a definition for grace? Anybody? What now? God's favor. Yes. God's favor. Undeserved. <laughs> well, that's a silly definition. <laughs> but, it's, but it's right. It's the only definition there is. <laughs> it's God's undeserved favor. We don't do that very often, do we? We give favor where people are willing to earn it, you know. God's unmerited favor. I remember that definition from my Baptist preacher when I was in high school. Grace is God's unmerited favor. We could also call it God's unmerited love. We could also say God's unconditional love. I am becoming aware that all Christians do not believe in grace. Let me tell you something. I know I've told you this before because it was funny. Years ago, all late 80s or early 90s, uh, it was an Easter Sunday, and uh, I remember uh, Danny Dietrich was at our house, and I don't remember whether this was Danny Dietrich is our former choir director for 13 or 14 years uh, during the last 80s and, and uh, much of the 90s. And um, I'm going to have lunch with, with Danny in a, a week or so from now. Um, and Danny was at our house. I remember it very well. And my mother was living. And she made, she made some banana pudding. And it was good banana pudding. Everybody loved it. And then after we, after everybody was gone, she went back into the kitchen, and there were all of the bananas on the counter that were supposed to go in the banana pudding. <laughs> it was banana pudding without a single banana in it. And yes, it was good, but there's no way you could call it banana pudding. It was pudding. Good pudding, but not banana pudding. And my mother had the bananas left to show. Okay. Christianity without grace is not Christianity. Because that's what this whole thing is all about. 
It's about grace, and I am discovering that a lot of people do not believe in grace. There's a guy named Tom who writes me every week. He's a smart guy. Christian, you know he has to be smart because he's a lawyer. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Christian is a lawyer. And uh, he, he's, he's, he, he's biblically literate. Uh, <laughs> well, I don't know what biblically literate means in this case because he, he writes me every week generally to tell me in, in more or less after he reads the little article that I'm going to hell <laughs> and I'm leading my flock <laughs> in the same direction. Okay, now I call him a friend because you can't talk back and forth to somebody for 10 years and not, uh, I, I have some affection for the guy who's always telling me I'm going to hell, although we've never met, all right? And uh, he, he's always saying things like this. He says, God does not love everybody unconditionally. Well, now that's news to me. I, I really didn't think there were any Christians who would actually say that out loud. He says it out loud. He says, God only loves us if we keep his commandments. God only loves us if, if we do what God wants us to do. If God, if we don't do, God doesn't love us. Now, where does, it, where, does, where does he get that, okay? I once had the traumatic experience in a grocery store of uh, walking along there, and uh, a woman with her child was acting up. And I heard her say to the child, if you keep doing that, mama won't love you anymore. And I was... I was astounded that any mother would say that to her child. But actually, some parents live that way. Heard about a woman this week, heard a woman talking, who said that uh, she would go down to where her father was working. And uh, she, she had three brothers, and on his desk at work, he had three pictures, one of each of her three brothers. And she said to him, uh, Daddy, how, how do I get my picture on your desk? He said, you don't get it automatically. You have to earn the right to have your picture on my desk. I'm going to ask you, is that love? That, that is, that's not love. Jesus, Jesus is always using parents as an example of God's love because his understanding of the way parents love kids is to love them unconditionally. I mean, this is my kid, and whatever this kid does, there's nothing, no way to turn the love off. The love is built in. That's parental love. And that's really... The only thing that love is, if it is like hiring salary, you do what I want you to do, then I will love you. Somebody who can turn the love on. You can't turn love on and turn it off. It's either there or it's, or it's not. So where does this guy who writes to me and others who, who write to me? Uh, I, I got another letter recently, and it came through our church thing. And uh, Jason saw it. And so he sent it to me for my attention. Uh, and he suggested it sounded like hate mail. <laughs> and I wrote back to Jason, I don't call this hate mail. The people that write to me and tell me I'm going to hell, I don't, I don't call that hate mail. That is devoted Christians who simply do not believe that God loves us unconditionally no matter who we are or what we've done. Well, where do they get the idea that God would love us conditionally? Let me read you something. 
kind of rough. The Lord God said to the Israelites, I give you these commandments today. The Lord your God set you high above all the other nations. And if you obey all of my commandments, I will love you and serve you. You will be blessed in the city, blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, the crops of your land, the calves of your herd. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed, and you will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. With my knee situation, I particularly need those blessings when I go out. Coming in, I'm happy. Going out, that's another problem. <laughs> now, what does, what does this understanding of God say? God as God is pictured here. If we do not keep his commandments, however, he said, ha, <laughs> you got to read the fine print. However, God says, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all of his commandments and decrees that I am giving you today, all these curses will come upon you. You will be cursed in the city and you will be cursed in the country. Your basket and your kneading trough will be cursed. The Lord will send upon you curses, confusion, and rebuke in everything you put your hand to until you are destroyed and come to sudden ruin because of the evil you have done. The Lord will plague you with diseases until he has destroyed you from the land you are on. The Lord will strike you with wasting diseases and with fevers and inflammation with scorching heat and drought, with blight and mildew, which will plague you until you perish. Thus saith, I won't finish the sentence. That's where he gets it. I'm not going to tell you that Jesus invented grace. I'm going to tell you that Jesus revealed grace and until he revealed it it's not something that most people knew unless they had experienced it from God directly because this is what God has always done for us and to us this is the way God has always loved us and no they did not know it throughout the pages of the Old Testament and many Christians who hang on to that image of God do not know it now. But this is the way God loves us. And I, I wish I could just snap my finger. Well, I can't snap my finger. I wish I could snap my finger and all of us would realize how much God loves us. My sister's going to begin that class on near-death experiences next Sunday at 945. Yes, here in the summer, where a lot of people are gone, we're going to go ahead and she's going to begin the class at 945 in the corner room down here, and it'll break in time for lunch on near-death experiences. When people have near-death experiences, the thing that astounds them the most is not so much that heaven is there or that the folks greet them, well, they come back and they say, I do not have words for this. I cannot tell you how much God loves us. They say, I am God's favorite person in the world. And by the way, you are also God's favorite person in the world. We had, we had a little kid in the church about yay high. And I entered the fellowship hall one time. 
And this child just broke loose from whatever he was doing. And he just ran toward me and he wrapped his hands around my legs and just held me. And I thought, how wonderful that this kid really loves me. And then I saw him go up and hug everybody in the room. <laughs> so much for my special blessing. It was everybody who loved in the same. This is what God has for us. And listen, the gospel, the real gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that God loves us unconditionally, does not, it doesn't sound right. It is almost impossible to put it in words. And when our blessed Lord put it into words, people must have thought he sounded crazy. And today, a lot of Christians still think he sounds crazy, so they just ignore it. If you just ignore Jesus, maybe he'll go away. And he won't interfere with what I already believe about God. That God is sometimes just as mean and ugly as I am. Okay? Well, God ain't. <coughs> Listen to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Notice how strange it sounds. It's going to sound strange to you. But this is what love is all about. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist the evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, you turn to them the other cheek. And let them slap you again? That sounds right. <laughs> Pretty sure you're getting slapped on both cheeks, left and right? <laughs> I've, uh, I, I know a family and, and the mama Told, told the kid in relationship to his little sister, she did something to him and he ran in the house and said, Mama, she did this. Mama said, remember what Jesus said, turn the other cheek. He went back out, she did something else. Come back in, turn the other cheek. He went back out, she did something again. Mama, I'm all out of cheeks. <laughs> when I was a kid, uh, <laughs> I, had, uh, I had trouble with my cousin, Mike. My cousin, Mike. We were enemies at the age of three. Mike was always beating up on me. I mean, he would come, the first thing he'd do is shove me down, okay? Well, my grandmother got tired of it. This sweet, sweet Christian lady, she got tired of seeing me beaten up. And so she said to me, Max, the next time Mike hits you, you hit him back. Okay. Well, poor boy, Mike accidentally stepped on my toe one time. And I laid into him like dirt on a pig. I mean, I was all over that boy. Okay. I actually don't remember it. The family has told me this story repeatedly through the years. That's the only reason I know it. Mike and I never did get along. I mean, we went to school together all those years, and we were cousins, but we were never friends. And there was a little bullying from his side even through high school. I don't know what it was all about. I always wanted to be a friend, but... He just wouldn't. I have dreams occasionally from time to time. Uh, Mike passed away last year, by the way. Uh, we, will, we will not be reconciled in this world. We will not be good buddies in this world. But I have had dreams from time to time in which Mike and I are good friends. We're good buddies. And those dreams are uplifting. What I'm telling you is this enmity from my childhood has really been with me and back there and hurting all of my life. Because that's what it does. That's what happens when you withhold love.
from people. It's with you all of your life. I know a member of, uh, well, I know someone here in the church years ago, years ago. A wonderful older lady. She, well, now, I'm an older person, too, but I wasn't at the time. And uh, she had two kids. And during a period early in her life, she had to leave her kids with her mama, okay? Because she and her husband were struggling. And uh, when she picked up the kids, she didn't pick up both of them. She picked up one of them. She picked up the girl and uh, left the boy. He felt abandoned. And all of their life, there was a coldness between them. I used to think it was funny. I love this lady. And uh, I'd go visit her and I could sit beside her and, and hold her hand and talk to her. Just like she was my grandmother. But when I saw the son with her, there was a. There was a distance and a coldness, and I thought, look here. He's known her all of her life, but he felt abandoned. Love withheld does that. After the service, I said a lot of wonderful things about this lady because I did love her dearly, and he came to me after the service and said, you know, you just didn't know Mama like I did. Well, no, I didn't. I didn't feel unloved by his mama. I felt loved. With God, there is no selective love. And, and let us understand, this is the whole world. It makes no difference who you are or what you've done. He loves, he loves the guy behind the bars for murder just as much as God loves you and me. I know that's difficult to comprehend. But when the guy behind the bars for murder discovers that, that's transforming in his life. Because only love saves. Love is the foundation principle of the world. And withholding love, making love conditional, destroys. It eats away at people. <laughs> hey, I brought... I brought something today. What time is it? Oh yeah, I got time to show you this. Our communion goes quickly. On second thought with my knee, it may not go as quickly today, but it'll go all right. I look like I'm hurting, but I'm not. Two Tylenol will do wonders. I brought my crucifix. <laughs> I know Methodists aren't supposed to have crucifixes, but I've got one. Uh, I bought it online because it was, it was so beautiful. It's probably 200 years old, something like that. And we, we Protestants, we came in and, and we took all of the imagery out of the churches and we took Jesus off the cross. We say he doesn't belong there because he's already resurrected. But I think God wanted us to see this. He wanted us to see him hanging there like this. Nails in his hand and nails in his feet and his arms stretched out because God wanted us to hear this message. I love you this much. I love you. Child of God, whoever you are, however you are, Whatever you think about yourself, this is what I think of you. This is what you are worth. And he wants us to remember that from the time we get up in the morning to the time we go to bed at night. We are loved. We are beloved. Someone came back from one of those near-death experiences saying, God is my biggest supporter. 
God is your biggest supporter. As I was working on this sermon, I paused at one point and I said to God, God, I'm going to let you love me as much as you want to. Love me as much as you want to and let me know it. Join me in prayer. God of grace and glory, you have done all that you can to show us how much you love us. Let us, let us receive it, not just in this moment now, but in those times when we are worried, when we are afraid, when we feel that life is going down instead of up, when things seem beyond our control, remind us that we are loved and that love is sufficient for everything that we go through in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.